This is EHJ Today at the annual scientific sessions of the American Heart Association in Chicago 2014. And I'm Tom Lusher, editor-in-chief of the European Heart Journal. And I'm talking to Dion Stoop from the uh, Baker Institute in Melbourne and to Carl Kern from the University of Arizona where he's professor of medicine. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. No, pleasure to be here. So the AVOID trial, uh, what is the question? that uh, made you start this project? Yeah, thank So uh, the airverse oxygen in myocardial infarction study essentially is questioning this fundamental practice that we've been doing for over 100 years, which is um, giving oxygen to all patients um, with uh, suspected acute myocardial infarction. It's something, you know, I was taught first day of medical school, you go to a, a first aid course and you're taught to give oxygen. Nursing students, it's the same. We all almost reflexly yeah, it's a reflex. put yeah. patients on oxygen when they describe any ischemic symptoms. Mm -hmm. And um, what was interesting is that really, I think out of Europe, you know, the, the European guidelines were the first guidelines to question this practice, highlight that one, there isn't very good clinical data supporting this, you know, fundamental first aid principle that we've all been doing. And maybe more concerning is that there's physiological reasons and some nice physiological studies really over the last 30 years that have highlighted maybe at a physiological level this is not the right thing to do by rendering a significant number of patients hyperoxic with giving them high flow oxygen. You know hyperoxia has been shown only after 15 minutes via, of oxygen via a mask to cause significant coronary vascular, uh, increase in coronary vascular resistance, reduction in coronary blood flow, uh, potentially increasing free radical product, um, uh, production. Uh, um, attenuating microcirculation and that all may um, increase reperfusion injury. Um, so, th you know, th these processes may be the very thing we don't want to be doing to patients with acute coronary syndrome. So you were hyp hypothesizing because you call it the AVOID trial that it may actually be harmful. Yeah, so really building on, you know, a Cochrane review came out in 2010 questioning this practice. And so that was really the, um, the fundamental hypothesis of the trial was, is our current practice of giving oxygen uh, to all patients early in their acute coronary syndrome, or is it potentially increasing myocardial injury? And uh, how did you design your trial? So it's a, a very pragmatic trial. It's essentially run by and coordinated by Ambulance Victoria. They have a fantastic research division with a lot of experience in running pre-hospital trials. And we, we really wanted to tease out is if the current practice early in um, the first medical intervention, which is when the paramedics arrive, um, does the application of oxygen to all those patients uh, increase myocardial injury? So the trial's designed um, the one of the key interesting aspects of the trial is pre-hospital randomization of patients. So the trained paramedics would arrive at the patient, um, sort through inclusion criteria and then randomize the patient. And this is pre-formal consent, so a delayed consent process. And the patient would be consented formally in the hospital um, by research staff when they were stabilized. And what were, what were the two arms? Uh? So, um, so, so inclusion in the trial meant only, you could only be randomised pre-hospital by yes. paramedics and so to get into the trial you had to have symptoms suggestive of STEMI for less than 12 hours, mm -hmm. a pre-hospital ECG that was consistent with STEMI mm -hmm. and then fundamentally you had to be normoxic and mm -hmm. we define that for the trial as those patients with a saturation on pulse ox of 94% or greater. Mm -hmm. A normal conscious state, we, um, we thought there would be no issues with uh, cerebral perfusion and that you're gonna be taken to one of the nine participating hospitals. Mm -hmm. And so if all of that was met, then the paramedics would open their opaque envelopes, wh which randomize the patients, and then either put you into the oxygen or no oxygen arm. So if you randomized to no oxygen, you continued on no oxygen. So you um, there was certainly no um, blinding at that point. Mm -hmm. And if you're on oxygen, then uh, paramedics would apply eight litres per minute. So reasonably high flow, but that's fairly standard practice, I think, for many paramedics around the world of oxygen via a, Hudson, uh, via a mask. And that continued. So that continued in the emergency department, coronary, during their coronary angiography, and then uh, onto the ward. So the intervention period stopped when the patient was stable on the ward. And what was the uh, primary outcome? So it was a co-primary endpoint looking at myocardial infarct size using the routine biomarkers of creatinine kinase and troponin. So we looked at 
uh, main area under the curve. Yeah, so the, the primary endpoint was really the main peak of yeah. the two enzymes and we also looked at area under the curve and that was uh, the main endpoint of the study. And then the secondary endpoints were there were safety endpoints looking at uh, clinical endpoints whilst in hospital, in particular things like pain score, a lot of uh, debate about does oxygen uh, improve symptoms, rates of arrhythmia um, and then not powered for major adverse cardiac events but still described and then interestingly we um, brought all the patients back at six months for those that agreed would come back for a cardiac MRI to look at a definitive final infarct size at six months on cardiac MRI and a third of the patients uh, came back for that. Okay and how many patients did you enroll? So uh, 638 patients were randomised pre-hospital, but because of the pre-hospital nature of the trial, there was um, a number of patients who, when they arrived at hospital, uh, physicians would determine that they actually weren't ST elevation MI mm -hmm. patients. And I think this has been seen in a number of pre-hospital trials. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up with a final number of 441 patients with ST elevation MI. And what did you find? So the, the, the main finding on the enzymes, so if we looked at creatinine kinase first because um, it was the highly significant mm -hmm. result, showed we showed a 25% increase in creatinine kinase, both peak and area under the curve, with a P of 0.01 in the oxygen group. So when we looked at creatinine kinase, significant increase in myocardial infarct size or myocardial injury on CK in those that were administered oxygen. When we looked at troponin, maybe a, a more sensitive marker, um, whilst the curves were very similar, again, this 20% increase, it was a non-significant result. Um, and so there was this signal towards increased myocardial injury on, C on CK, but troponin was non-significant. In terms of the secondary endpoints, just hypothesis generating, we saw significant increase in recurrent myocardial infarction in those that were given oxygen in hospital. We saw major clinical arrhythmia, so those that with, with arrhythmias that required medical intervention, whether it be atrial or ventricular arrhythmias, there was significant increase in the oxygen group as well. Um, and then in the 139 patients who came back for a cardiac MRI, the signal towards increased infarct size was again present. So if you looked at late getting enhancement overall, so if you, the raw infarct size, it was uh, significant to, again, this 25 to 30 percent increase in myocardial infarct size on late gadolinium enhancement, p-value 0.04. When you normalise that for length left ventricular mass, it was just a trend with a p-value 0.06. But again, highly um, provocative in the sense that there was this signal towards increased harm. Very interesting results. So, Dr. Kern, you're uh, the discussant. What do you, what do you think about this? Well, I, I actually think that's a perfect dis, uh, description. It's very provocative. This really challenges the dogma that, uh, as Dion mentioned, has been there since we all went to school. Every patient with cardiac ischemia should have oxygen with really no regard to whether they were hypoxic or showing signs that they needed such. Um, so I think it's a very timely paper or presentation. Uh, indeed, that Cochrane review uh, really just a year ago in 2013 highlighted this very thing. The, the data to date suggests there may be harm, but it's way underpowered and more work needs to be done. So I congratulate uh, the authors and the uh, presenters of, of this important work. So what, what do you think is uh, the uh implications for our, our clinical practice. Well, and I think that's the next step that maybe not be fully solved yet. You know, I think again it's very provocative. Some of the signals were positive for infarct sizing being worse with oxygen therapy, but others were not. And um, and the clinical endpoints that we really would love to know, you know, are people really harmed? It, uh, probably aren't there yet, but I agree that um, it was clearly rightly so powered for the primary endpoint and these others are uh, hypothesis generating and really kind of leave it uh, for the next day. So uh, do you have any plans to do a next trial or what would you do based on what you found uh, as a next step? I suppose there's one is, you know, as an uh, interventional cardiologist and clinician, um, you know, the main message I've taken from this is that maybe we should think of oxygen as a drug. It's clearly got benefit in patients who are hypoxic and potentially life-saving, but maybe it should be prescribed and we shouldn't indiscriminately, right. you know, give patients oxygen. Um, I, I think, as Dr. Kern says, we need a larger trial and powered for hard endpoints. 
and uh, you know our Swedish colleagues are, are doing a, a fantastic randomised registry trial, very you know very similar to ours, but powered for mortality. And I think they're you know in discussing with them, they've randomised over three thousand patients, and hopefully we'll we'll have a you know a follow up to avoid um, that clearly shows what rates of major adverse cardiac events are. Well, thank you very much. This was a very interesting discussion and tells us that we shouldn't just do what we did decades ago just because we're used to it. Thank you very much indeed.